Hi Internet! Welcome to the Gretron YouTube channel. To celebrate the release of Final Fantasy 16, I decided to release 16 videos ranking the Final Fantasy games in a variety of categories. Each game has their strengths and weaknesses, so I thought it would be a fun way to compare and contrast the games. These lists are just my personal opinion, trying to balance objectivity and personal preference, and likely failing to satisfy anybody. So, if you disagree with my ranking, which you probably do, let me know your ranking of the subject in the comments below. This is a ranking of the endings of the main series Final Fantasy games and tactics. This ranking is not going to factor in expansion packs for the MMOs, and I'll only be ranking the ending of the base game endings of 11 and 14, rather than going through the ending of each expansion. Some of these endings I have a lot of thoughts on, others not so much. Also, I feel like this should be really, really, really obvious, but there's going to be spoilers for every single one of these games. I'm talking about the endings of these games, and it should really go without saying that this means I'll be going into spoiler territory because, you know, I'm literally talking about the endings of each story, but you guys know how the internet is. Somebody is going to complain if I don't give a spoiler warning despite clicking on the video title, so you have officially been warned. This is going to be a video full of spoilers. Got it? Okay, cool. Now, let's go ahead and get into the ranking. Number 16, Final Fantasy XII. Final Fantasy XII's ending is not very interesting, kind of like most of the game's story. Vaughn becomes a sky pirate, Ash becomes a queen, Botch becomes a knight, and hangs out with Larsa. It's the obvious ending for all of the characters, but it doesn't feel too exciting. I just don't feel any real emotional payoff with any of the characters in their roles. Vaughn always wanted to be a sky pirate, and he became one. Ash wanted the throne back, she got it. I guess Botch is the most interesting character since he technically moved to an opposing faction and taken on his brother's role. But given what a good leader Larsa is implied to be, it's still not that interesting of a career move for him. Balthier and Fran supposedly sacrifice themselves, but nobody's really buying it, and despite me liking the characters, I literally feel no emotions as the events on screen unfold. Nothing interesting happens with any of the cast in this ending. It's the epitome of, meh, and I don't have too much to say about it. When playing the game with my wife, after watching the ending she said out loud, that's it? So yeah, Final Fantasy XII's ending is not very satisfying. It's bland and predictable. Predictable by itself isn't bad, but combine predictable with bland, and you've got the worst ending on this list. Number 15, Final Fantasy 1. Final Fantasy 1 ends with the heroes defeating Chaos and stopping the time loop. But because the time loop has been stopped, nobody remembers the heroes of light in their journey. But you, the player, will always remember your journey. Sure. Okay. Look, the trope of the forgotten journey slash it was all dream isn't one I find to be particularly good or compelling. Most of the time, I think it's not very good. While there are some exceptions to this rule, as I think Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories actually handles the concept in a somewhat interesting way that attempts to make it more relevant to the overall narrative, in the case of Final Fantasy 1, I find it to feel more generic and closer to the quality of Super Mario Bros. 2's ending. I don't think the trope is good, and thus I don't think the ending is very good. Number 14, Final Fantasy V. Final Fantasy V's ending is mildly interesting in that the ending varies based upon how many of your characters are knocked out at the end of the final battle. The characters who were defeated get sucked into the void, seemingly to die, and the characters that remain place flowers in remembrance of their fallen comrades. But don't worry, everybody eventually reunites and rides off into the distance on chocobos. There's not really any great character resolution in the ending, but the ending music is incredible. I cannot stress enough how fantastic the music during the ending of this game is. It's a top-tier Final Fantasy track, and really elevates the subpar ending pretty significantly because of how great the tune is. Final Fantasy V's ending is not spectacular by any means, but the slight variations in the ending based on battle results and the great music helps elevate it above the just plain bad endings. Number 13, Final Fantasy VI. The ending of Final Fantasy VI is basically just escaping the final dungeon with little character moments for each party member. There's variation in the ending based upon which characters you recruit in the World of Ruin, but the variations aren't super interesting, and most amount to showing an empty screen of where the character could be recruited, subtly encouraging you to play the game again. The game treats the ending like film credits, treating each party member as both a character and an actor. I honestly think it falls flat to see Umaro as Umaro, and find it to be generally pointless. There are some who argue that Final Fantasy VI is a giant play, and all of the characters are actors playing characters within the play. So, let's run with that for a moment. Let's say you gave Strago a different name and called him Bob. Throughout the game, everyone would refer to him as Bob. But when you get to the credits, it would say Bob as Strago Magus. Meaning Strago Magus would be the character name and Bob is the after name. If it's a play, why are they referring to the character by the after name and not the name of the character within the play? It doesn't make sense and feels redundant. 
It's cool unless you think about it for more than 10 seconds. That said, I like the idea of each character getting a final moment to shine. It's a nice touch, but it doesn't really offer any great resolution to the character arcs. The fake-out ending midway through the game was actually more satisfying as an ending. But, for all my critiques of the ending, it does offer each character one final chance to shine, and given how endearing and beloved the cast of Six is, I appreciate the ending for that. Is it a great ending? Not really. But it does allow for some nice character vignettes. Number 12, Final Fantasy 3. During the making of Final Fantasy 3, Hironobu Sakaguchi's mother tragically died in a fire, and Sakaguchi ended up using the medium of the game's storytelling to help process his grief. Thus, themes of life and death weaved their way into the narrative of Final Fantasy III, and after defeating the final boss, a Ted Skrull appears on screen with a sincere, heartfelt message of hope from Sakaguchi. It's beautiful and truly authentic, an artist pouring their hearts out into the world, and you can really feel the connection of Sakaguchi's words all these years later. After the Tet Scroll, we get what is a somewhat standard Final Fantasy ending where the characters take a world tour, dropping off the NPCs who assisted in the final battle back at their homes and revisiting those classic locations one last time. While the ending isn't the best in the series, the amount of heart it has is something that can't be denied. Authenticity and heart are powerful things, and the pouring out of Sakaguchi's soul, combined with the general charming and pleasing nature of the rest of the ending, makes this one thoroughly satisfying. Even if other endings in the series would offer more satisfying and emotional conclusions to their narratives, it doesn't take away from how much heart this ending has. Number 11, Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn, basically has an action hero ending. You, the Warrior of Light, piled in Magitek armor, run away from an explosion while the main theme of the Final Fantasy series plays in the background. Look, my favorite actor is Sylvester Stallone. I love cheesy 80s action movies, and thus running away from an explosion while swelling music plays speaks to my primal caveman brain. It's really damn cool to see the player character escape just in the nick of time with a massive explosion behind them. A Realm Reborn is actually one of the darker Final Fantasy journeys, but the ending is overly triumphant and joyous. Thancred is saved. The three nations are saved. Everybody's ready to celebrate and party, which, as a lover of 80s hair metal, I also appreciate. It is officially the end of a dark era and the beginning of a bright new era, which also serves as a brilliant metaphor for the game itself. I'm more mixed on A Realm Reborn than a lot of folks in the Final Fantasy community, but I do think the ending is really great. And for me to like it as much as I did after a disappointing final boss battle really shows the strength of this ending. It's a bombastic, feel-good ending that puts a big smile on your face. Number 10, Final Fantasy XI. The ending of Final Fantasy XI's base game mostly focuses on the redemption of the Shadow Lord's soul after his defeat by the player. In terms of the base game, the character arc around the Shadow Lord was easily the strongest part of the game's narrative, and the strength of that character story continues into the ending. Because the writing is as good as it is, and because the emotional payoff is so good, is why XI's ending ranks as high as it does. XI's ending doesn't feel like an ending compared to other games in the series, and instead feels just like the resolution of a character arc. It feels small and personal, despite you just having saved the world from a demonic entity returning from the grave. However, even though the ending feels small and intimate, it's incredibly well written and fully satisfying. There are some folks who only consider an ending to be triggered if you get to staff credits, but this was the final boss of the base game version of Eleven when it launched, and was generally considered the ending of the game at the time. If you want an ending in Final Fantasy XI that triggers credits, the expansion Rhapsodies of Anadeel does have staff credits and an ending that's really great, as it ties in together basically all of the expansions and serves as a love letter to the entire game. However, that's not what I'm ranking here in order to have this list be fair, as having 20 years to tell your story is an unfair handicap against the other games on this list. However, I felt it was important to briefly acknowledge this ending, as it is quite good. Number 9, Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy II ends with an appropriately bittersweet finale. Given how dark and somber the adventure in Final Fantasy II was, it makes sense that the game's ending isn't overly joyous. The Emperor has been defeated, and peace has been restored to the land, but the world has undergone some great hardship, and will need time to rebuild after the many tragedies of war. Though our heroes had realigned with their old companion Leon to take down the Emperor, the truce was ultimately a temporary one. Leon had joined the Empire in a lust for power, and desired to take on the mantle of Emperor himself, and though he had saved the world alongside his old friends and family, he feels like too much has changed between them and decides to leave. It's a very shonen anime exit, and it makes you wonder if he'll continue on with his villainous desire for power, or if he'll find some kind of path to redemption, and just serve as a rival to Furion. Either way, Furion lets his old friend go, and states his excitement for their next meeting. It's vague and leaves a lot to interpretation, but in a good way. 
In addition to their farewell with Leon, the ghosts of the characters who died during the course of the game's adventure briefly appear, as if to bless Furion and his friends, the younger generation, to take care of the world after they're gone. The world may have gone through some hardships, but there looks to be actual hope for a better tomorrow. It's an incredibly strong ending, especially for the era, and still holds up well to this day. Final Fantasy II has a truly excellent ending that perfectly fits its narrative, offers great emotional payoff, and still has room for player interpretation. It's truly great. Number 8, Final Fantasy IV. Final Fantasy IV's ending is mostly just a standard super happy ending. Basically, everyone gets to become royalty and live happily ever after, including Yang, who just becomes King of Fabul because he's cool, I guess? The former king is still alive, but just decides Yang should be king because reasons. Okay, sure, why not? Everybody gets to be royalty. You get a kingdom, you get a kingdom, you get a kingdom. All of the rulers of Final Fantasy IV's world are our hero party members, meaning we don't have to worry about geopolitics anymore because we know everyone running the different kingdoms is a good guy. Sure, we'll go for that. There's a bit more to the ending than just everyone becoming royalty, though. Cecil has a good moment of acknowledgement with Golbez, and Kane hangs out alone on a mountain being cool as he tries to figure out his own journey of redemption. But for the most part, the ending of Final Fantasy IV is just overwhelmingly joyful, happy, and triumphant. You did it. You saved the day. And you know what? After the harrowing journey you've gone through, it's nice to get something that's so unapologetically victorious. It's a feel-good ending. It's not too complex, but it fits the story and ties things up in a nice pretty bow. Sometimes the simple happy ending is what you want and need, and it works great here. Number 7, Final Fantasy Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics has an ending that is bittersweet in many ways. It's been a dark adventure, and we already know from the prologue that Ramza is known to be forgotten in the annals of history. His deeds of heroism will be forgotten for centuries. We knew this going in, and it looks like after the final battle, Ramza and our entire party of heroes died in the conflict. We see Orin at the gravesite for Ramza and Alma, mourning their loss and vowing to tell the truth behind their story. Then, off in the distance, he sees Ramza and Alma riding on chocobos, but he's not sure if it's actually them or his mind playing an optimistic trick on him. It's left up to the player to decide if they think the two of them truly survived the final battle. Personally, I do think they lived and got to live out quiet and peaceful lives in solitude after their harrowing adventures. But again, the ending is bittersweet. We know that Oran's attempts to reveal the hidden truth of the church led him to being burned alive and branded as a heretic. But his descendant was able to uncover the truth and is ready to reveal to the world the truth behind Ramza and what really happened in the War of the Lions. In the end, the truth ultimately prevailed, even if it took centuries. There is a mixture of tragedy and triumph in the ending of Tactics. Further adding to this bittersweet nature is our final scene with Delita. Peace has been brought to the realm, and Delita tries to offer some semblance of romantic affection to his wife by offering flowers, but Queen Ovile has become so disgusted with Delita, and the way he cold-heartedly used others to obtain power. She finally snaps and stabs the quote-unquote hero king. Though wounded, Delita uses the same blade to stab Ovilia, and he is left wondering if his ends justify the means mentality was truly the right path, and whether Ramza was the one who truly found happiness. Delita may be remembered by history as a hero, but in the end, he is alone and miserable, having focused too much on his goals rather than a life of honor. Ramza, who is not remembered at all, ultimately has peace in his soul and true happiness, having lived a life of justice and moral virtue. It's an absolutely brilliant end in all accounts. Perfection. Number 6, Final Fantasy XV. After defeating Arden in an epic one-on-one -on -one battle, Noctis knows there's more that needs to be done in order to defeat his immortal enemy once and for all. The feud between Arden and the line of Lucis has lasted for centuries, and the only way to stop the cycle and bring an end to the eternal darkness Arden brought upon the world is for Noctis to defeat his ancestor in the great beyond. Thus, Noctis asks the spirits of the kings of Lucius to kill him so that he can venture into the afterlife and destroy Arden before he can reincarnate and continue the cycle. His three closest friends, Prompto, Ignis, and Gladiolus, face down a massive horde of enemies to give Noctis the time he needs. It looks like this battle will be their last two. Noctis remembers the words his father told him at the beginning of the game. Walk tall. It's his time to do his duty as king, take responsibility, and save the world from total destruction. The kings of Lucis are summoned and fulfill the request of Noctis, but one hesitates. It is the spirit of his father, but Noctis insists on following his path, and the father kills the son. Noctis enters the void to confront Arden, but he's not alone. The spirit of his departed betrothed, Lunafreya, assists Noctis in vanquishing Arden. In the process of destroying his enemy, though, the spirit of Noctis is destroyed, fading into nothingness. Arden's goal was to end the line of Lucius, and he was ultimately successful. Yes, he died in the process, but he accomplished what he set out to do. 
It's a Pyrrhic victory for both parties. We flash back to an epilogue of our main cast resting at a campfire, as they had done so many times over the course of their journey, for one final rest before going on to their suicide mission. It's a heart-wrenching scene that showcases the tragedy of the situation and the love between these friends before they march to their inevitable deaths. The entire ending feels Shakespearean in its tragedy. We then move to another scene. A new dawn rises after the eternal night of Arden's reign. A brighter day has finally arrived. The throne room of Insomnia is empty, but beautifully decorated. Noctis and Luna appear together, finally able to be united in marriage. How they got there, or whether they are even truly there at all, is left vague and up to interpretation. It's an abstraction, perhaps a personal heaven, or perhaps an afterlife. Or, if you read the Dawn of the Future companion novel, it's the true ending of the game that got cut due to time constraints of the development cycle. It's however you want to see it. Noctis then shows Luna Freya a photo. Before he marched off to face Arden, Noctis got to choose one photo from his journey to take with him. A keepsake of the memories he made, personalized to the experience of each player's adventure through Eos. The two of them look at the picture and share a smile before Luna and Noctis are finally able to put their heads down and rest together. The logo of Final Fantasy XV is revealed and changes to add Noctis to it, adding new context and finally explaining what the logo is supposed to represent. Just forget the fact that the logo is originally from Versus 13, and the woman in it is supposed to be the goddess Etro and not Luna Freya. The effect of the logo changing is super cool and unique to Final Fantasy XV. There's a lot going on in this ending, and each part of it is incredibly powerful. It's a fantastic ending, but it is an ending that might not be entirely deserved. The stuff with Noctis and his father is great in a vacuum, but the game did not do a good enough job with its setup to make the payoff as great as it could have been. The ending is brilliantly directed. It's a very strong ending, and since I'm ranking the endings and not the build-up to the endings, it ranks high, but the big flaw is that it's not quite earned. It's not completely unearned either, but there simply weren't enough building blocks present to justify how great this ending is. Final Fantasy XV is sadly an unfinished game in a number of ways, but its beautifully tragic ending is executed extremely well, and is one of the best endings to a Final Fantasy game. Number 5, Final Fantasy VIII Final Fantasy VIII's ending is absolutely fantastic. It's a bit more on the abstract side for a good chunk of the finale, but that works to its benefit. The time compression stuff is trippy, and actually ends up being really cool. The idea that the power of love and friendship is enough to counter time, space, and reality breaking apart is really sweet, in a sincere and cute way. I'm a sucker for the power of love and friendship, and while it's a bit absurd that these emotions can withstand the complete collapse of the universe, it ends up working because so much of Final Fantasy VIII is feels over reels anyway, and the abstract visuals are a feast for the eyes. There is, of course, a time loop in this ending, where Squall travels back in time and convinces Adia to start Seed so that the sorceress can be defeated, and thus nothing in Final Fantasy VIII would happen if Squall hadn't traveled to the past and told Adia to start Seed, and Ultimecia hadn't traveled to the past and given her powers to Adia, and, well, you get it. It's a classic looping time paradox. But after we're done with paradoxes and the crumbling of space-time, we get the beautiful reunion of Squall and Renoa. Love conquers all. The imagery is extremely over the top, but it's beautiful. War Criminal Cypher gets a happy ending just hanging out with his friends, which is kinda awkward, but whatever. Final Fantasy VIII's story was never that coherent anyway. But then again, George W. Bush is just hanging out making painting, so... kinda realistic, I guess? We get to see Laguna in the ending cutscene as well, visiting Rain's grave, which ultimately feels very tragic given the game's themes of love, and him ending up living out his days without his one true love. But we do get to see a memory of a time when the two of them were together, and that memory is something he's always able to treasure. After all of that, we return to Balam Garden for a big party, and the theme music from Final Fantasy has never given off more of a high school graduation vibe than it does here. We're reunited with the cast at their big grad party, and the game ends with Squall and Renoa finally kissing. Final Fantasy VIII is a bit of a mess overall, but the ending cinematic is incredibly creative and unique. And, like the intro to the game, it's also very, very cool. Narratively, there's plenty of problems with the ending, and plenty of holes one can poke into it. However, the entire time compression sequence of the ending is so visceral, creepy, unnerving, beautiful, heartfelt, and cool all at the same time that it elevates the entire ending sequence into the top five. Is the ending a little unearned, like 15s? Sure. I don't really buy the Squall and Renoa romance, but the great parts of this ending are so great that I can't rank it any lower. Number 4, Final Fantasy XIII. Final Fantasy XIII has a really great, excellent, conclusive ending for its story that neatly ties up loose ends and offers great resolution for its tale. Cocoon is collapsing, and looks like it will be destroyed. But the main theme of Final Fantasy XIII is defying fate, and our heroes refuse to give up, taking destiny into their own hands. In the end, 
Fang and Vanille end up sacrificing themselves, turning into a giant crystal pillar to hold up Cocoon to prevent it from crashing down onto Grand Pulse below. Like Atlas, it is through their sacrifice that they are able to hold up the world to avoid its total destruction. As with everything in Final Fantasy XIII, this sequence is visually stunning. But it's not just style over substance here. Thematically and narratively, this acts as a perfect cap-off to the adventure, especially given that Fang and Vanille are from Grand Pulse, but were willing to sacrifice themselves to save the people of Cocoon, their supposed enemy. But in the end, they are all human, one and the same. With the Falci gone, that means that Cocoon society will no longer be able to function technologically. There aren't enough natural resources on Cocoon for people to live there, so that means that the residents of Cocoon must move to Grand Pulse and start a new life more in tune with nature. It's change, and change can be scary, but there's hope for the future. The future looks bright. Our heroes are no longer branded, and are free to rebuild society without their past gods. Sarah and Dodge return. They're no longer crystal and are able to reunite with their loved ones. It's a happy ending, though there's just enough of a tinge of bittersweetness to make it have more impact than a purely happy ending. Overall, the characters are in a good place, having learned their lessons, grown, defied fate, and now ready to move on. The gods have been defeated, and now it is humanity's time to decide their own fate. It's a great resolution to the story, there is no need to expand upon anything further, it feels absolute in its completion with zero storytelling need for a sequel whatsoever. Number 3, Final Fantasy IX. Final Fantasy IX's ending begins with our heroes attempting to escape the Aoife tree, but Zidane wants to stay behind. He wants to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Kuja, because Zidane's kindness knows no bounds. He knows Kuja is close to death, and wants to give Kuja some kind of genuine connection, despite all the atrocities he has committed. Zidane arguably has the biggest heart in the whole series, and his mercy and sympathy showed towards the main antagonist in his last moments shows how great his compassion is. After heartfelt goodbyes with the party, and promising Dagger that he'll return, Zidane rushes through the Aoife tree in an exciting action sequence before having an intimate conversation with his rival. The conversation is cut short as the Aoife tree consumes them. We fade to some time later. Vivi offers us a monologue, reflecting on the journey, life, and death, as we see scenes of Nine's cast after the final battle, moving on with their lives. Life goes on. We find out through the monologue that Vivi, our beloved little black mage, has died. His limited lifespan has finally faded, but new black mages that look identical to him have been created. In a way, they're children of Vivi, of sorts, and thus in some way, he still lives. Life goes on. I'm not crying, you're crying. Shut up. We then move on to the rural palace of Alexandria. Dagger is still heartbroken over the loss of Zidane. Attempts to cheer her up are in vain. She, and some of our other heroes, gather to watch a performance of I Want to Be Your Canary, the play from the very beginning of the game. The words of the play are more bittersweet and profound with the loss of Zidane. He never did come back. At the emotional height of the play, the cloaked Marcus removes his robe to reveal himself to be Zidane, professing his love to Dagger from the stage. The music swells as Dagger runs down the stage, pushing through the crowd, dropping her pendant and running into Zidane's arms. At that moment, she is not a summoner or a queen. No, she is her true self and with the man she loves. She embraces him, but also smacks his chest for leaving her so distraught and worried for so long. It's beautiful, endearing, and romantic. We see our familiar friends in the crowd applauding as the music crescendos to its climax. My wife ended up bawling her eyes out at this ending. She told me that she had no idea that a video game could make you cry. The ending of Final Fantasy IX is a beautiful work of art that perfectly caps off the journey these characters have gone on. It's absolutely brilliant, and rewatching the ending for note purposes ended up making me cry. It's just so ridiculously good. A brilliant ending to a brilliant game. Number 2, Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X's ending is absolutely heartbreaking. The defeat of Yu Yevon means that the Faith can finally stop dreaming, which means that Titus, a dream of the Faith, will disappear. His existence begins to fade as he says his final goodbyes. As much as Titus didn't want Yuna to sacrifice herself for peace, Titus sacrificed himself, in a selfless, yet hypocritical move. Was there no other way? The cycle did break, but at what cost? Yuna runs out to embrace her lover, but she passes right through him. She's not able to hold on to what she desires to hold on to the most. Titus embraces her from behind. It's a tragic Shakespearean love. Star-crossed lovers whose destinies don't allow for a happy ending. The swollen version of Two Xanarkand is the most heart-wrenching rendition of the composition yet. In the Japanese version of the game, Yuna tells Titus, thank you, while in the English version of the game, she says, I love you. Both versions offer something incredibly deep and profound, and the way I headcanon this ending, I interpret some combination of the two of them. Thank you for all you've done on this journey, 
for helping me see myself and the world differently. Thank you for opening your heart to me. I love you for all of that, and my heart is breaking because I can't hold on to you. My heart is breaking because you're leaving, and I can't keep you here no matter how hard I try. In her words, Yuna says all of this and more, no matter which version of the game you play. Titus makes his leap off the airship into the great beyond. He flies past Orin and Braska before seeing his father, Jet. The two slap hands like companions on the same sports team. And it makes sense. Both of them had the goal of saving Spira, after all, and they accomplished their goal. They are both of the Xanarkand Abes. Good game, team. We did it. But more than that, father and son have finally healed their wounds and accepted one another. In his final moments, Titus fully embraced love. He found peace. We move to some time later. Yuna whistles off the pier. Titus told Yuna to whistle, and that wherever she was, he'd come and find her, as long as she whistled. Like Final Fantasy VIII, it was to be a way of them finding each other no matter the circumstance, but Titus does not answer her call. Yuna then addresses the people of Spirit in a great speech about loss and hope for the future. The religion of Yevon has been revealed to be a lie, and sin has been defeated for good. Spira's entire society is about to undergo radical shifts. But Yuna is there as a beacon of hope, as she always has been, and will do her part to guide Spira into the future. Later, in a post credit sting, we see Titus, in a fetal position rising out of the water, a fantastic symbol of rebirth. The scene later gets additional context in 10-2's ending, which honestly isn't that bad, but we're not talking about that here. We're talking about the ending of Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X's ending hits its emotional moments hard, but they're all completely earned. It's the perfect thematic cap to the story, and its fantastic focus on the tragic romance of Titus and Yuna makes it one of the most powerful endings in the series. It's a sad love story that pulls at your heartstrings, and it's an absolute tearjerker ending. Absolute perfection and worthy of the number two spot on this list. Number one, Final Fantasy VII. Ranking Final Fantasy VII's ending as the best in the series is apparently a controversial stance to take, but for the life of me, I don't understand why. The most common criticism I've seen is that the ending is too abstract, too abrupt, and doesn't offer proper resolution to the characters. As with a lot of criticism around Final Fantasy VII, I don't consider those critiques to be particularly good or insightful. VII, due to its popularity, attracts a lot more commentary, and not all commentary is equal in terms of quality or, quite frankly, even basic understanding of the work and its thematic elements. So, allow me to explain why I believe Final Fantasy VII to have the best ending in the series. Cloud has a premonition that Sephiroth has yet to be defeated. He knows that in order to defeat Sephiroth, he has to go into this final battle alone. Sephiroth is not just the villain set out to destroy the planet. He is Cloud's shadow, the darkness within our hero's psyche, that continues to haunt and corrupt him. And Cloud must dive deep within himself to finally cleanse his influence once and for all. The final battle with Sephiroth is one that can't be lost. Omni Slash is your only option, even if you hadn't unlocked the limit prior. Cloud utterly and completely destroys Sephiroth. As powerful as Sephiroth is, as strong as a stranglehold he may have had on Cloud, Cloud proved himself to be stronger. He was able to rise above his darkness and be his true self. Sephiroth is fully, truly vanquished. Ignore the sequels and compilation. This is the end of Sephiroth, right here and now. After the battle, Cloud finds himself surrounded by the life stream. A hand reaches out to him, and the theme of Aerith plays. He reaches out to it as if reaching out to the heavens. Reality sets in, and it's not the hand of Aerith, it's Tifa. It's an incredibly beautiful moment. When dealing with grief and loss, we want nothing more than to reach out and touch what we no longer can. While their spirits are always with us, watching over us, we need to embrace the here and now, the people who are with us in our daily lives, and continue to love us, rather than cling to what we can't have. We can still have love for those we have lost, but we need to embrace the love we have. Tifa is the girl that Cloud needs in his life. Tifa is the one that he needs to love. He'll always have a place in his heart for Aerith, but he can't cling to her forever. His present, and his future, is with Tifa. She is the one who ultimately is able to reach out to him and grab on. He can hold on to Tifa. She's the one he's meant to be with. By accepting her hand, Cloud is finally able to move on and live beyond his grief for what he's lost. He is able to fully embrace what he has. Our heroes frantically escape the Northern Crater, and Meteor continues to approach, and begins to wreak destruction across the planet. It looks like all hope is lost, but then Holy finally activates. The music is no longer harsh and frantic, but beautiful and serene. The corrupting influence of humanity's worst impulses isn't stronger than the force of the planet to protect itself and the cycle of nature. Through love and harmony, Holy is able to force back the corrupting presence of Meteor. 
a blinding light covers the world, and we end on Aerith's face as the chimes of the opening theme play one last time, implying that her presence is one with the planet and that her mission is finally complete, but also implying that she may have been aware of her role the entire time. Roll credits. An incredible reimagination of the main theme plays as we reflect upon our journey. The ending is vague with its blinding light. Holy was designed, much like the weapon creatures, to defend the planet against threats and destroy anything that may harm the planet. Before there were sequels, the game left players with a question. Is humanity worthy of being saved? Would Holy deem humans worthy to continue living on with the planet, or would Holy decide that they were too much of a problem and needed to be cleansed? The optimistic themes of the game gives an obvious answer to this question, but it's ultimately down to the player's choice in how to interpret this. But the nature of the ending being vague in this way forces the player to contemplate these thoughts, and thus contemplate their own role in relationship to the planet they live on, nature, and the cycle of life and death. There is a beautiful interconnectedness to nature and the planet that allows us to keep a connection to even those we have lost, as we are all part of life's cycle eternal. That's what Final Fantasy VII is ultimately about, discovering oneself and where one connects to the grand cycle of life. After the credits, we cut to a scene 500 years later. Red 13 runs alongside his descendants to see that Midgar, once a bastion of toxic pollution, has now become overgrown with plant life. Nature and the planet have thrived past humanity's darker tendencies. The laughter of children can be heard, implying that, perhaps, humanity found a way to coexist with the planet. Life goes on. Many criticize this ending for not providing a more clear epilogue for each of the individual cast members and not answering whether or not humanity survives. By the time we've reached the ending, the arc of the characters have already been resolved, aside from Cloud and Tifa, who get their resolution in the ending scene. We don't need a tour of seeing Sid hang out at home, and Yuffie hang out at home, and Barrett hang out at home. We get it. They're all going to go home and go back to their lives and find some kind of meaning in this new world. But if we took the time to do that, we'd lose sight of the grander point the game is trying to make, and the ending still offers very strong character resolution. All of the arcs are resolved and we got an ending of pure beauty. Many debate whether or not this is even a good ending, let alone best in the series, but for me it's an easy winner. Final Fantasy VII's ending is profound, moving, and deep. It's bold and artistic, but satisfying on a character level. It's a beautiful work of art, and in my opinion, the best ending in the series. Thanks for watching this video. Again, these lists are my personal opinion, and I'm definitely curious to see you guys posting your rankings in the comments below. Be sure to do the YouTube things, the liking, the subscribing, etc. And if you like this video, don't forget to check out the other rankings in the series. Thanks for watching, and I hope you find peace and happiness in your life. Cheers!